I'd like to call to order the uh, CRPD Board of Directors meeting for June 4th to order. And Melissa, I'd like to ask you to lead us in the flag salute. Are you there? We have yes. two Melissas. Smith, Smith. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'm and take it. The United States of America. And for which, for which it stands, stand, one nation under, 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 under God, God indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice and for all. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to ask a quick question. And Melissa Smith, you can't answer. When was the last time Melissa led us in the flag salute? How many people remember when Melissa led us in the flag salute the last time? 1983. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> it was at our retreat. She had just joined the CRPD and it was at our retreat at the uh, senior center when she led us in the flag salute. Elaine, roll call, please. Director Lyon. Here. Director Nichols. Yes. Director Holt. Here. Director Hopper. Yes. Director Cuthbert. Yes. We have all members present. Item number three, special presentations. The Recreation Division connecting with the community through unprecedented times. And Rochelle, are you heading this up? Thank you, Chair Lang. Uh, members of the board, we have Tim Dewar and Melissa Bertino that will be presenting today. I'll let them do it. It's award winning, also. <laughs> Thank you, Rochelle. <laughs> uh, good evening, Chair Lang, members of the board, and fellow CRPD staff. Melissa and I are pleased to be here this evening to give this presentation. As the title of our presentation suggests, we are in unprecedented times. And uh, as we all know, our community and organization has had to deal with unprecedented times on a few different occasions over the past few years. But each time our community and staff have risen to the occasion. Our presentation tonight will show a variety of ways that our staff has continued to provide services, engage the community, and enrich the quality of life in the Canal Valley during the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, specific services have been deemed essential and the following are essential services that CRPD has been providing. The Senior Nutrition Program is a federally funded grant program available to anyone ages 60 and older, jointly operated by CRPD and Ventura County Agency on Aging. I do have a video that I, in the sake of time, I'd like to play and I'll talk over the video. Since the COVID-19 crisis began, CSCP and Global staff, including Julie Spivak, Patty Ham, Mike McAdam, Victor Melkor, and several others have been working tirelessly to ensure seniors in our community continue receiving meals. Initially, this was a challenge with the newly imposed stay-at-home orders, but fueled by a passion to serve and a love of their senior patrons, staff immediately developed a minimal contact drive our drive-thru system, instituted physical distancing measures for their walk-up patrons, and partnered with Senior Concerns for Delivery Services. Prior to the pandemic, Senior Nutrition served approximately 60 meals per day and are now serving an average of approximately 140 meals per day. From March 13th through May 31st, staff have served a total of 7,657 meals, of which 5,866 have been hot meals, and 1,791 were either shelf-stable shelf kits, frozen meals, or meals from the World Central Kitchen. In addition to serving meals, staff have helped fulfill another essential service to our seniors. They have provided socialization and a few minutes of interaction and joy to individuals who would otherwise potentially have no human interaction. Some have described the service as a lifesaver and the experience as, quote, the spark of their day. Moving on to our next program, the Safe Passage Lunch Pro Program. This has been a successful partnership between the Conejo Unified School District, the Safe Passage Youth Foundation, CRPD, Art Trek, and several volunteers. 
Together, they have ensured that lunches have continuously been served at both the 850 Warwick apartment complex and the Conejo Creek condominiums for families in the neighborhood who would normally rely on lunchtime meals provided at the school. On average, approximately 85 meals are served daily at 850 Warwick and approximately 220 lunches daily at Conejo Creek. CBUSD has provided the food while Safe Passage, CRPD, ARTREC, and volunteers have helped with the distribution and coordination of other supplies and necessities. Through the efforts of Tim Hagel, the Safe Passage Youth Foundation has secured thousands of donated items including diapers, baby formula, and fresh produce, has coordinated donated meals from local restaurants on weekends, and has ensured all families have Wi-Fi capabilities at home so that children can participate in distance learning. ARTREC and CRPD have provided art projects and enrichment activities to families while also acting as a liaison between the families and the school district to assist with distance, with distant learning and to secure learning materials. This past Friday, uh, shown in the picture, three CRPD staff members who live or have lived at 850 Warwick and have been working the lunch program were presented with multiple scholarships from the Safe, Safe Passage Foundation, Art Trek, and a local donor with, grandma, with love from grandma to assist them with their post-secondary education. All three just recently graduated from South Oaks High School. Food Share Ventura County is a nonprofit organization and member of the Feeding America Network, the nation's largest hunger relief organization that distributes nearly 12 million meals annually to over 75,000 people experiencing hunger. Normally following a food pantry model, they reached out to CRPD in late March, looking for a location to serve as a large drive-through distribution center. Utilizing both Canal Creek South and Canal Creek North at different times, 10 to 14 part-time CRPD staff members from eight different units have been assisting with re registration and food distribution every Thursday since April 2nd, and they were out there today. For some staff, this has been their only weekly shift for months, but they continuously report to work with a smile a great work, that work ethic and a sense of purpose knowing they are assisting their community during these difficult times. Each week, approximately 400 food kits have been distributed to residents of Newbury Park and Thousand Oaks who are in need of food. And, uh, we'll, we'll be trading off. Melissa's up now. Thank you, Tim. When the stay-at-home order went into place, Blood donation agencies saw a decrease in people coming out to donate. CRPD was asked to open facilities to conduct drives while adhering to the COVID-19 guidelines, which called for by appointment only donations. The American Red Cross and Vitalint, which operates blood drives for Los Robles Hospital, have utilized CRPD locations since March. The fabulous South Oaks Teen Center has hosted six of these drives, each one having over 60 draws. Orchard Community Center has also hosted two drives with over 60 drives as well. Now we'd like to move into some of the community engagements the division has been working on. The first being the Acorn ad. In an effort to support local print media and find ways to continue to connect CRPD to the community, the division signed on to take out eight full page color ads in the Thousand Oaks Acorn. Content was collected from all units to try to engage all scopes of service. Fun historical trivia, what park is this, weekly contest, kids activities that included connections to partner organizations like CBUSD were incorporated into these weekly spreads. When the quarantine went into effect, the community started relying more than ever on virtual ways to make connections. CRPD Marketing and Communications Assistant Kelly Madison has increased postings on our Facebook and Instagram to inform the public of closing and opening of amenities. All units started increasing social media postings that included facility updates, ideas for simple admiral projects and games, and of course, Senior Adult Center Supervisor Patty Ham weekly 2 2 Tuesday posting. As the stay at home order continued to be extended, staff were creative and correlated postings with events that were being can canceled. Examples of that is when the popular Bark in the Park event was canceled, staff posted fun dog bone recipes that you can make at home with your pet. <laughs> 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 of 
fun program that the division just completed implementing is the Caneo at Home campaign. The idea originated from Heather Cousins at the Thousand Oaks Library. She had seen another rec division up north doing something similar and, and offered to supply gently used donated books if we were to implement. The campaign started on the premise of leaving a bag of recreation materials on a patron's doorstep that contained some rec supplies and other materials that you would find during one of our programs. Staff run, ran with this program and really made it their own. Each unit delivered 10 bags to randomly selected patrons from their winter or spring rosters, totaling 100 bags that have gone out to the community. Not only did they ding dong ditch, but some units found additional ways to engage, including staff delivering personal karaoke performances, or plays in a bag, which included scripts, costumes, and USB drives to record their show.
Virtual programming has emerged as a way for CRPD to continue doing that during this time. Multiple units have created their own staff-led online programs and coordinate with percentage contract instructors to offer virtual courses. Examples include the following. Since Friday, May 1st, the Therapeutic Recreation patrons have, part have been participating in a weekly program called Virtual Games with Friends via the Zoom app. Registration has been free and open to the participants age of 15 and older, serving as a way for participants who have been following stay-at-home orders to see their friends. Every Friday features a different game, including bingo, charades, hangman trivia, and guess that song. Led by TR supervisors Devin, uh, Devin Herbert and coordinator Cheryl Jew, the program has been a big success. Participant attendance has been consistently upwards of 18 people, and the Tri-County Regional Center has reached out to staff asking for more programs like this for all ages. Uh, TR is, unit is currently working on adding more virtual programming. Tomorrow night, the cultural unit will be live streaming a modern magic show that will feature audience participation. And additionally, the Comedy on the Hill program that traditionally takes place on the second Saturday of each month will return in a virtual format next Saturday, June 13th. Offered through the Teen Center, independent contractor instructor Dr. Steve is offering a Zoom class for ages 11 and older. This specific class titled COVID-19, an introduction deals with the science behind COVID-19 and will clarify some of the information and misinformation regarding this new coronavirus. Global Center has also offered two Zoom classes taught by volunteer instructors. The meeting of opera started on April 27th and runs every Monday afternoon, and a meditation class began on May 14th and runs every Thursday afternoon. Both programs have seen between 10 and 12 participants for each class. Staff continues to pursue more virtual class options as we move forward. CSBP volunteers have repeatedly stepped up to answer the call to meet the need for facial masks and medical caps for individuals and essential workers in the Canal Valley. As of the middle of May 13th, different volunteers, 13, or excuse me, as the middle of May, 13 different volunteers have produced and donated over 2,100 homemade masks and over 250 homemade medical caps to 23 different local organizations shown on the screen. CSUP Director Julie Spivak has been coordinating the pickup and delivery of all the products from volunteers to organizations. In, prepar in preparation for the opening of our summer camp, CRPD has also received 300 homemade masks to be distributed among staff working our programs. They're actually very comfortable. We just got ours. <laughs> Um, the Therapeutic Recreation Supervisor, Devin Herbert, and Borchard Center Supervisor, Kurt Gunning, collaborated to create a video that aimed to show the Caneo Valley that CRPD continues to bring the community together in creative ways and to embrace, embrace an inclusive and diverse community of varying demographics. The video involved the simple concept of one person tossing a water bottle to be caught and then tossed again by another person, creating a metaphorical human chain and connecting everyone involved in the video.
the shutdown of facilities, the Park District's preschool and pre-K teachers went to work preparing to move to a distance learning model. The district's classes from all four community centers have continued their programs online via live classroom Zoom meetings that have included stories, live finger plays, songs, and even show and tell. Teachers provided at-home packets that would go out via email that students can work on and feel like they were doing their homework, just like their own siblings were doing at home. Today, Dos Santos Preschool and Pre-K celebrated their graduation by doing a drive-by parade to say goodbye to teachers and classmates. Another way that CRPD online learning programs have continued is through the elementary music program. As CBUSD transitioned to their distance learning model, CRPD's elementary music program followed suit. These elective classes are part of the student's normal day and, make a, and made a seamless transition via Zoom to run online. I want to share with you with you the numbers because they're impressive. Overall, 20 instructors have provided 150 weekly classes. 1,750 kids are participating. Band and Strength meets twice a week with course meeting once a week. Here's a short culmination of one of the teacher's strength participates in an impressive Zoom performance.
That's great. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. And we are available for any questions. Sure. First, thank you, Melissa and Tim, for a great presentation. That was phenomenal. And the creativity of the various programs, uh, amazing. Uh, board members, Director Huffer. Yeah, I don't have any questions, just a couple of comments. It looks to me like you guys have been 10 times as busy in the last couple to three months as you were before the, all the, the close down and the, the creativity that you folks are exhibiting is just, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, you know, serving everywhere from the young kids to the seniors and everything in between. Uh, just, I, I'm so impressed by what you're doing and I, I know that the community really does appreciate what you're doing. Um, I, I did have a chance to um, try the senior nutrition, I think it was the Friday before Memorial Day. And uh, I'll tell you, it was nice to have some different food from what I've been preparing for myself all these, all these weeks. So um, I, I, I really enjoyed that. I, uh, I, I salute the people at the Goble and everybody in, in the recreation division for what you've been doing. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Susan? Oh, well, I just want to say, you know, I, the programs are fantastic. There are a couple I'm going to double check on that I wasn't aware of. Um, and I know uh, Julie Spivak, you know, is uh, very involved. She's at the, uh, the Goble Center. And um, I mean, she's, she's doing a great job where she's doing, you know, what she's doing. Um, so, um, I, you know, I've dealt with her on more things than, uh, than some of the others. So um, I, I am amazed at, at everything that's going on and I applaud all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Holt. Director Kessworth. I was really touched. And um, I haven't been on the board that long, but when I first was elected, we had a shooting and then we had fires. And CRPD kind of held the community together with all that they did. And then we kind of went along and then we've had COVID-19. I've only been here for what, like a year and a half? And then to see all that you're doing to bring our community together and to help those that are less fortunate to get through, you know, this uh, very uh, unusual situation we're in. It was a very, very, um, very touching presentation. And it's made me so proud, even though I'm not doing any of that, to be a part of this organization and has really um, brought me to an awareness of how important CRPD is to our community. It's not just ball fields. It's not just yoga classes. So I have to say when I went through the program guide, um, I really want to retire so I can just spend all my time going to all of your things. <laughs> uh, we offer so much to this community, which is why I wanted to be a part of CRPD, but I had no idea of how vast the influence is, and I'm still learning. I do have a couple of questions. One, do you think you'll continue with the senior nutrition in the cars that looked like it was efficient? Or when this is all over, will that not happen anymore? It shouldn't happen. <laughs> Um, I don't think that's been determined yet. I think part of it is the so socialization of being in the cafe. Okay. But it might, it, it might continue to be an option for those who want to take it to go. We haven't thought about that yet, but that's a good idea. Okay. So I was just wondering because I thought, boy, you've got a long line of cars. There's a lot of seniors that want to eat lunch there. I qualify. I thought many days, maybe I'll go over there and get my lunch. <laughs> so. Um, the other thing I'm wondering is, um, being that I do Zoom meetings with young kids and then even with our Pledge of Allegiance and doing it with my family, how did you get those kids from Ode to Joy all coordinated? I mean, that's, that would seem fairly a miracle. We can't even say the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing and you have all of those kids. 
I'm told it's a complicated process that involves recording themselves and having some Zoom features that aren't available on the basic level to coordinate it all together. Oh, okay. Okay, because I thought, whoa, I tried with my class one time to just have the sing songs together. I thought, okay, that was a disaster. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Thank you. And the presentation was beautiful. Thank you, Director Kessler. Director Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, too, was very impressed. I mean, I, we've heard some of these things in the past with either ideas or trying to get some things moving, but to kind of see this whole package and how things have matured, uh, I, I kind of have mixed emotions. I mean, one, I'm absolutely thrilled to see what's been done, but also very sad and disappointed to see empty uh, community centers, you know, like the videos as the water bottle is passing with it. Mr. Hare being the only one in the center of the community center. Um, so to, to, to be forced into doing this, I mean, that, that you know, kind of gets me in the gut. But then when I see what's been done, that gets me in the heart, is to see how, how, how you, through your awareness and sensitivity, have kind of created these new opportunities. <clears throat> yeah, I can see where I mean, you, some people might like curbside service, but uh, you know, I've heard the term socialization mentioned a couple of times and to me that's what our community is desperately missing right now is just being able to you know socialize I mean even in with those of us in this room we're all socially distancing and you know it's like well is that person accepting the fact that I'm away you know can I shake their hand can I hug them can I even approach them closely to talk you know we're kind of in that position so that whole socialization is taking on new, new territory for us and you know, when you talk about like the drive up, some people like to go to the cafe just to visit. You know, the food just happens to be a, you know, an added extra bonus. They just want to go to talk to people. So when I see that the CRPD can find ways to at least create some, some semblance of activities and remembrance, I guess, of, of what socialization was like before we were able to actually get back there. I mean, it just, it amazes me at how you folks have kind of pulled this together. But on the other hand, I'm not amazed because I've seen the creativity around just not in this venue. And just to kind of see how that energy has been refocused and say, okay, what platform do we have and how do we incorporate new ideas? And to see how you've pulled that together is, is just amazing to me. So again, thank you for that. I did have a question, a couple of questions. <clears throat> Uh, first, when it, the safe passages, is that providing meals just to the students or is that to the families in general? Uh, fam families have been involved with it as well. Okay, because I know at school it's just the children that are getting the meals. So. Okay, and then my second question is, how are you going to recruit behind all these graduations and when the time is needed to get new kids, I say kids in a loving way, uh, to fill the roles that they now have vacated. I imagine some that are going to more park or local might still be available, but you know, I, I know it's kind of a maybe an unanswerable question, but I, I know you still have to at least have some idea of what you can do if that opportunity comes. Uh, it's, some, it's, it's a good question and a challenge. We've been actually recruiting probably for a few weeks now and holding virtual interviews, um, trying to get people uh, Hired for able to run the programs for summer that we, that we are offering. But I think this isn't really uncommon every summer. We probably do have a lot of um, staff that do graduate. And we just hope that there's more young people that have been in our programs and want to be a part of our organization that we can continue to hire and, and keep for as long as we'll have them. So um, it's a little bit harder this year just because there, there's not a lot of work out there. So people aren't thinking to look or they're still afraid. But um, we have been able to hire some new people and hopefully we'll get them working soon for some of our programs. I thought maybe you were going to like withhold their last paycheck until they bring somebody else to replace them. Well, that is a referral system. We should maybe start. That was a good, <laughs> good, good uh, idea. Thank you both. Excellent programs and an excellent video. Loved it. Thank you. Well, presentation Thank you. as a whole. Videos. Thank you, Director Nichols and other board members. Your comments. Uh, we're right on um, the, as mentioned, the creativity, and that is a reflection of our staff, our professional uh, rec people, 
and other in the support roles. And uh, we've said this at many of the uh, employee recognition uh, events that we are really blessed with quality people from the top down, uh, Jim. So thank you uh, all rec people and the complete CRPD administrators uh, for all that you do uh, to serve our community. And uh, when Director Cutsworth was mentioning she was not aware of these uh, activities that the Park District has been doing for, you know, over 50 years. And it goes, you know, uh, unnoticed for the most part until you're a recipient of one of our programs or participant in one of our programs or become a board member. So uh, we, the Caneo Valley, is really blessed having CRPD uh, as their uh, park and rec provider. So again, Melissa and Tim, thank you so much for putting that presentation together. It was uh, par excellent. And Rochelle, thank you also for your leadership. Mr. Chair, I think Melissa has something else to add. Just one more thing. This was a total in-house production, and we couldn't have done it without our lovely IT team. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey. I didn't Mr. Chair, understand one, that. One, what did she say? Uh, she said that it was an in-house presentation that was put together with the help of the IT team. Okay. Thank you, Mark, and the IT team. And I just wanted to make one observation, Mr. Chair. I don't know if uh, Tim Durr is going to be leaving or not. But I noticed many of the male staff in this room have been sprouting facial hair, and I don't know if they're <laughs> trying to copy the general manager or if they've just had face oh, coverings on so long that they forgot to shave. But I, I sense a trend here. <laughs> Finally got a haircut at least. <laughs> okay, we're moving on to uh, item number four, items from the public. Mark, do we have any public? We have one uh, comment from the minister, Kurt Gunning, saying, hooray, Melissa and Tim, applause, applause. Okay. Agree. Uh, moving on to item five, approval of the agenda. I'd entertain a motion at this time. I move the approve. It's a tie between Holt, Director Holt, That's okay. and Director Hunter. That's all right. Forget it. So thank you. Any uh, comments on the agenda? Modifications, if not, roll call vote, please. Director Lyons? Yes. Director Nichols? Yes. Director Holt? Yes. Director Huffer? Yes. Director Huffworth? Yes. Thank you, that motion passes. We're moving on to item eight, consent calendar. Uh, A, approval of the minutes of May 21st, 2020, our regular board meeting and uh, B, approval of the warrants, accounts payable, registered total $290,049.55 and payroll $346,000 even. That's unusual to have an even number there, I think. Okay, I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Thank you, the second. I'll move to second. Thank you, Director Cutsworth. Any comments or questions associated with the consent calendar A or B? If not, roll call vote, please. Director Lang. Yes. Director Nichols. Yes. Director Hall. Yes. Director Hopper. Yes. Director Cutsworth. Yes. Thank you. That passes. Item number seven, deferred matters. I'm going to open a public hearing uh, for our preliminary budget fiscal year 2020-21. Any public want to make a con comment? Kirk Gunning? <laughs> okay. If no public wants to make comments, I'm closing the public hearing on our preliminary budget fiscal year 2020-2021. And we'll continue that to our next meeting. Item eight, items for discussion, uh, CRPD update regarding COVID-19 local emergency. Um, General Manager. 
Credo. Yes, thank you, Chair Lang and members of the board. Um, as you will probably recognize, I've been doing these updates for the past uh, several meetings, and uh, this will be no different, but I'm going to probably keep this one a bit shorter than I have in the past. Just cover a few, um, you know, um, few of the, the boundaries that were within uh, the um, Ventura, so, so I have a CRPD, a, a Ventura County and a California State website to pull up. Um, the first is uh, the most recent health order, 529 on uh, May 29th, um, the Stay Well Ventura County, Safely Reopening Ventura County. So that's only a six page order, so that's the current order that's up, and it basically says, we do whatever the state says we can do, although we can be more stringent in certain areas. They can't be less stringent than the state. Um, really what the Ventura County has done um, that really affects us that might be of note is there's no more special rule or limitation for persons over 70 in the current health order. So to the extent anybody wants to uh, go out, I believe this order um, would not limit that. So I guess in the future, should the other board members wish to participate in person here in the room, that would be uh, an option. Um, but otherwise, it really didn't affect too much of, of what we do. So that's on the BC Emergency website. Under the CRPD what's open, what we did do in uh, light of, um, you know, the, the uh, state order, uh, we created um, our new update to what's open. So virtually everything is open except that which the state does not allow to be open. So this is what you would see on our website if you went there to click on, you know, the what's open or the COVID-19 update page. So the only things that remain closed are the community center, playgrounds, and pools. Paradise Falls, for not necessarily a COVID reason, it's more of an overcrowding issue that we hope by limiting access will reduce the crowds over time until we get into the really hot weather when people don't even want to be out at all. Um, and then, you know, let, let kind of Paradise Falls cool off for a while. And then we put the basketball courts in the kind of limited category because um, it's pretty clear that that's a pretty full contact sport. And so a five on five game with a bunch of teenagers is, is probably not consistent with the current health order in terms of ga gathering limitations and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we just put that cautionary note there. Um, and then when we go to the state's website, so this is under that covid19.ca.gov. So if you'll scroll down here under the questions and answers, you get to the to the what's closed. So when you this is the state's website now. So this applies to everybody in the whole state. Will that open now? Oh. There we go. So this is right off the state's COVID website. So these are kind of those those items that are in like stage three or stage four. Uh, so these are the items that remain closed and you'll see um, many of the gathering type things we do, but the biggie of course is yeah, community centers, public pools, playgrounds, picnic areas. Um, so those are remaining uh, closed for the state. Um, and then if you scroll to close that and scroll down a little to the next one, which uh, is our gatherings permitted. So here's kind of the killer for us. So gatherings are still really not permitted. Um, so when it comes to some of our outdoor activities or even indoor activities, they're pretty clear that they're not supportive of big gatherings of people outside their households. So what we, um, that's what we struggle with. So then when, when we know that the gatherings are generally prohibited, what we look to are the special permitted type of activities that we can do um, so that we can start to bring people back together. So that's where we get to the good news is that there's special permission for child care to be held and other essential services. And so for child care, there are um, specific rules and regulations, very detailed, that will allow 
us to do programming. There still is not direct, clear guidance for summer camps and sports, which is what they keep saying for about the last week. They're coming out, they're coming out, they're coming out. We have not yet seen them in great detail, uh, but we're using the analogy of childcare to design the summer camps that we are currently taking registration for. And I might be taking some of Rochelle's thunder, but I think we're, um, I actually have the numbers here. Um, as of June 1st, we started registration in the summer camps and clubs, and uh, we have 134 classes offered, different camps and clubs, and we have 1,350 already enrolled. So we're doing that under under the child care sort of rubric for you know the COVID protocols. Um, and then, of course, uh, you're aware I sent out the email yesterday based on, you know, we were a month out from July 4th, um, the uh, limitation on gatherings continues, um, the planning required to really get going, uh, multiple agencies having to, to have the resources and the, and the cost, all, all of the variety of things to consider, plus the added non-COVID concerns about just mass gatherings in the um, in the protest and maybe um, you know uh, other <laughs> issues going on. We we just didn't think being the only game in town when it came to fireworks was the right call. So um, you know, in consultation with the city, we went ahead and and canceled uh, the fireworks. So um, so that happened, and we. Um, or otherwise trying to do things within the order as Rex showed you with that great presentation and then we have now started the registration process for camps that will start on June 15th so in, in eight days I think so nine, nine days so um, and of course we just constantly await the next direction from from the state or guidance um, and and we have been hearing camps and sports group guidance should be out there any day now. So that's what we keep hoping we'll get so that we can kind of open our remaining things. Community centers are going to be tough. I think community centers, because they're indoor, are going to be of, of constant concern. But I think that the community center is really something, by definition, it's more of a general public drop-in unscheduled you know gathering place so i believe we're well within our rights to use those buildings for supporting child care or summer camp flip programs so we will be using the buildings they just won't be for open general public drop-in so and then of course the pool guidance has to come out too everybody in the aquatics industry is just waiting for the the green light with that i'm gonna go for questions Thank you, Jim. Are there any questions of our general manager, Director Huffer? Uh, a comment more than a question. You just you mentioned aquatics at the very end there, Jim. And I did happen to uh, go by the, the CLU pool a couple of days ago uh, when I was out jogging or walking, whatever, whatever George <laughs> needs it to be. But um, saw Dee there and she said they've They've already got all the procedures and everything set and ready to go, so they're just waiting for the state or the county or somebody to give them the green light and, and they're ready. So um, that was good to see. For sure. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Director Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. General Manager, I had a question on the closed and open uh, flyer that's, that's posted. I noticed on the basketball courts there was a comment there that said physical distancing required. Um, it was my understanding that CDC lists social distancing as recommended. So is it recommended or required? Mm, I, I, I could double check on that. If the allowance is for recommended we can certainly look at that and modify it but I think our I, I, I think the six foot separation has been in the required category, but I'll relook at that. So that's certainly something we could change to make 
Well, as far as the CDC website, it says okay. recommended. Okay. But I don't know if the public health officer has dictated otherwise. Okay. I'll look at that. But if, if it's referenced to CDC, I, it says, says recommended. I'll look at that. And then another question, this goes back to the uh, online version that you're showing from the state where it indicated that uh, in, in deference to our Constitution and the First Amendment rights that we have, that allowance has been made for religious facilities to have 25% of the capacity or 100 people to attend. But also within the First Amendment is our right for public assembly, which would seem to me that if someone said, hey, we want to have a public assembly at a community center, and we want to have 100 people there, that they are within their rights to do that. Is that ever been brought up? Uh, anyone saying, hey, I want to be able to use this? It may even be a religious group, I don't even know. Or even just to say at a park facility, we would like to have 100 people there. Uh, if that were to be brought up, it seems to me like they have the constitutional rights to do that under that directive from the state. Yeah, since uh, since that order's been modified, I'm not aware of any group looking to do that on our property. But if someone were to request that, I think we would definitely consider that, you know, as a you know a permit, like you're saying, a permit outside group permit yeah. request. Sure. Yeah. And then going back to your indication of being able to somehow start incorporating the use of community centers within the programming. Uh, it seems to me like if 100 people are allowed in a church sanctuary, that 100 people ought to be allowed in a community center. Um, is that something that would be worth pursuing to try and encourage recreational activities? Well, uh, in reality, the way the camps will work is they're going to be indoor-outdoor. So over the course of the day, there will be different uh, groups of kids having access to the building, I think based on the schedule, if I'm not mistaken. So. There might not be 100 all at the same time, but over the course of a day, there'll probably be that many that end up, you know, sometimes they're outside, sometimes they're inside. So, um, but getting that many people in there at one time, I guess then you can start to get into the real weeds of the purpose of their being in there, because remember, there's still that concept of high risk or essentiality of the service, and they don't, or the essentiality of the activity, and so they don't necessarily want recreation. In, in the opinion of the state folks, not as essential as going to church or mm -hmm. going to get food. So if you're going to gather with a whole bunch of people, you know, maybe yes for political speech or church or, or getting your food, but they don't want us gathering, I, I don't think, for just generic, recreational, have a good time, go to a concert, go to a sporting event. But obviously, there's an encouragement for exercise and healthy activity. But I think there's really been this emphasis on uh, sticking with your household or doing your things in a way you stay six feet away from others has been the, what I look at in reading the totality of all the different orders and regulations. That that's really the intent: mm -hmm. stay six feet apart. You know, when you're practicing your social distancing, wash your hands quite a bit and um, you know, just try to minimize your contact with other people was the gist of the of the rules. So and with the move afoot on behalf of the special districts trying to get districts recognized as being providing special or essential services, will there be some caveats there where recreation and park districts will be able to exercise a little more opportunities to provide recreational or, as we heard earlier, socialization, which is a key essential uh, service, especially for housebound seniors, where, I mean, to not say that that's essential to me is a, is a, a oversight to have for those who are making those decisions. But is there going to be some allowances for things like that if that were to move forward? Well, I, I don't know. I think initially it's just getting the, I, I think what we both heard from DCSDA the other night is just getting special districts defined uniformly at the federal level and having everybody agree on what they can mean, how that might affect the, how the state looks at us in terms of this COVID and health regulations. I, 
I really hope we're out of this <laughs> before that actually comes to pass, but maybe they do, as they have this legislation unfold, they do some of that, recognize the essentiality of some of our services, absolutely. Um, you know, and uh, I don't want to predict the future, we'll all see what happens, but given the events of the past week, you know, I think everyone's going to be very interested in looking at what happens with the numbers in the next three weeks or so. That will be an interesting, interesting thing to see. Thank you for your information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Director Nichols. Uh, anybody else? A uh, quick comment. I've been to three different uh, parks, and um, the increased usage uh, at all three parks is uh, really satisfying. I'm happy to see people out there in the open space using our facilities, et cetera. So I hope this uh, uh, continues uh, because I think people appreciate the opportunity uh, to be in our parks and to benefit from the uh, activities uh, associated with our parks. So. Okay, General Manager, thank you. Moving on to new items, uh, item 9A, uh, appropriation amount subject to uh, limitation fiscal year 2020-2021. Uh, Staff? Good evening, Chair and Directors. Um, this report's not nearly as Exciting as Rex. <laughs> um, but you can make it exciting. Um, we're still finishing the budget for next year. Um, we'll be coming uh, to you with that next time. But um, the estimated amount right now is $33 million. Um, and then the amount of that would be uh, that would uh, be limited under this uh, limit is approximately $23 million. So we'll uh, and that's all. Yes, Director Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your quick and brief. That's all it needs to be. Yeah, yeah I was but waiting just, for more. <laughs> in practicality, what does this mean for you as the financier for the organization? Uh, making sure we have enough money to do what we're doing with this with this number How do you refer to this in your day-to-day -day operations? What does it mean for you? Not at all. <laughs> we are required to calculate it to make sure we're under it. That's all it means. That's okay. all it means. And if there were The need to exceed this figure what happens then? Um, or maybe not the need the, the desire or whatever what I guess my question is, why is this there? Why is this number prepared? So it was in place to prevent reckless spending by government entities. It's somewhat been modified to make exclusions to say, okay, it only applies to certain types of tax revenue, certain types of options. So it's much less effective than it was when it was originally implemented. Um, for entities that go over it, I think they have two years to address the, the overage. So if you did have to go over the amount, you could say you're over by two million, but we're going to reduce that over the next two years by doing uh, having less than a million each year the next two years or something like that. So that would be the remedy. Um, but I mean, we're we're nowhere near that. Obviously, um, there are some technically the state has this issue and they have to come up with a plan how they would address that too. So, but that's what would happen. So it's probably more of an issue with the much larger governmental agencies than, than it is a yes. smaller special district. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was my only question. Thank you, for, thank you Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, I have a quick question for uh, Mark. Uh, we have a, a fourth. <laughs> we have a fourth window uh, that currently just has a CRPD uh, logo. And during Melissa's report and Doug's questions, I was wondering, can we have uh, both uh, ca a camera on our uh, board members and then on the administrators making the report? Yeah, uh, 
George, we, we actually don't have the ability to have multiple cameras at the moment. Um, so the answer to that is no. Uh, but if you see that um, the CRP logo screen, that's something that actually you can control. Um, you can mute that window out. And, or if you click at the top right of your screen or the top of your screen, you can actually um, control, like, to have people without a video showing to not show up as one of the boxes. I can walk you through it offline if you want That's, to show you how to I'm, I'm okay. It's just that, you know, there was two things going on, and I saw that logo just sitting there. I thought maybe it could be utilized for one of the uh, presenters, speakers. Okay. Uh, okay. Are there any other, Director Huffer? Yeah, I just <clears throat> wanted to point out, it wasn't really explained, I don't think, in, in the, the presentation here. The appropriation limit of 48 million plus has nothing to do with the district's total budget. It, it's only looking at the, at the per capita appropriations. And if you look at the, the, the numbers that the park district has, we wouldn't in a million years come, come anywhere close to $48 million. It, it has no relation to our total budget. Right. Okay, any other comments or questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Uh, and this is a resolution. Director Hupper. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to move that we accept recommendation to adopt resolution number 060420-A, setting the 2020-2021 appropriation subject to limitation to be read in title only, all future readings waived. Thank you. You have a second. Director Cussworth, I was thinking that you would be the second. Okay, any other additional comments or questions? If not, roll call vote, please. Oh, we read, have read, read, it, read it in the title only. Thank you, Director Huffer. Resolution 060420-A, a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Conejo Recreation and Park District, establishing the annual appropriation subject to the limits set forth in Article 13B of the Constitution of the State of California. Thank you, Elaine. Now, roll call vote, please. Director Lang. Yes. Director Nichols. Yes. Director Holt. Yes. Director Huffer. Yes. Director Nichols. Excuse me, Director Cuthbert. Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. We're going on to 9B, Capital Improvement Fund Grant. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, board. Uh, tonight, uh, it's a big bonus, well, cool. Um, this is the biggest year we have ever had for uh, the number of applicants and the amount requested. Uh, we had 12 applicants for $136,000. Uh, a lot of applicants we talked to, uh, you know, they're having some hard times with uh, money and, and, and revenue because of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, in general, we have $100,000 budgeted for this item. Uh, but we thought it was prudent that we uh, ask for the board for appropriation of $36,000 to cover the remaining uh, funds uh, needed. So everyone gets what they need. This is kind of a, like CRPD's own little stimulus package here to help these groups out and uh, make their uh, dreams a reality. Uh, you know, the projects that we've done, uh, you know, they, we, we start this process you know, throughout the whole year reminding them several times that this, this, this is coming up. Um, and I think they had a lot of good plans and a lot of good intentions, but then uh, us had, like, talking to them the last couple of months, they're like, wow, we just don't, you know, we just don't have the money to do this or the money to do that. So we had a lot of, uh, if you notice, we had, uh, what, four non-matching projects out there that because they just afford more, they said, well, maybe we sure we'll get up for more. But uh, anyway, so in general, like I said, we, uh, we this is usually an info item for the board, but due to the fact that we're requesting $36,000, it becomes a recommendation. Uh, if you don't approve it, not to have opinion in the corner, though, the committee would get back together. If the committee's uh, uh, recreation and parks folks, we'd get back together and reprioritize the projects to fit within the budget. Uh, but we do recommend. 
recommend that we do incorporate the money so everybody gets the, their money that, that they need. Uh, the $36,000 we're recommending coming from the Woolsey, uh, uh, Selvin, Cal, Edison, uh, Settlement Funds. Uh, we're going to come back in a couple weeks on for the, the rest of the $4.193 million for uh, recommendations for the allocation of that money, uh, along with some other some other capital projects. Uh, but leave this in your hands. And I said, this has been an extremely successful uh, program that we've had over the past 10 grant cycles. We've, uh, we've given out over $800,000 worth of grants to uh, dozens of different organizations. And it's been a very successful uh, program throughout the community. With that, we'll go for questions. Thank you, Mr. Hare. Good report. Yes, Director Cussworth. Um, well, first, I would like to uh, thank you very much, Mark, for making this whole presentation uh, better. So now, um, Director Lang or Chair Lang can actually see me. <laughs> so yes. that's been very nice. Yes, I saw so your I hand right away. I do have a question for Mr. Hare. Um, of course, I'm very supportive of this program, but I have had some of the um, organizations ask me, when would the money be available? Uh, July 1st, uh, July, uh, the projects and the money is available July 1st, so they cannot start the project until July 1st is uh, very clearly stated in their contract. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Director Huffer. Yeah, not a question, but a comment. I, I, I think it's great that we're in a position that we have those funds available through the SEE settlement that we, we can pretty easily uh, transfer 36,000 so that we can meet all the requests of these great organizations. Um, I am impressed by ETI. Everyone else just had nice round dollar amounts and ETI came out with exactly <laughs> 8,267, which I thought was pretty impressive. So kudos to them. <laughs> Director Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hare, thank you for the report the information, and I know this is a great way to encourage and to support our partners that we have, which is a key part of the, of the district. Uh, one question I had is, uh, it's my feeling that the SCE settlement funds should be used in some way that's related to the purpose that we got them, which is you know, wildland fire mitigation or something along those lines. Are there any of these projects that would fit in the category of somehow be having a nexus to that wildland fire mitigation purpose? Uh, I would say I'll that maybe tangentially, but not, not really. This is this is generally their their interest, but say that, like I said, we'll be back in a couple weeks and we do I remember when we had the board retreat back in January, um, we we talked about a few different projects that have a, a, a very close nexus to the uh, the Woolsey fire. So we are like drainage drainage improvements and right. some vegetation debris removal. Just to give you a sneak preview, that's like $1.6 million mm -hmm. of it. So that's that's a large portion of the, uh, of the settlement funds that we're recommending for to be allocated to. Okay. Yeah, and if, uh, just I'm a little, little hesitant to my colleagues here to uh, authorize the use of these funds that is not somehow related to the wildland fire mitigation or the damage that was done for the reason we got these. And not seeing that nexus with any of these. Uh, projects, I, I would not be able to support the use of that money for these projects. Uh, if we have projects that were related to that, I would support it, but uh, short of hearing or seeing what the report says on the uh, proposed projects in its totality, um, I, I would not be able to support the request. Thank you, Director Nichols. Um, Mr. General Manager and Mr. Hare, um, are there other potential sources of funds to cover those that shortfall? Oh, we could uh, definitely take it from fund balance. I mean, it's not it's not a lot of money um, in in the big scope of things. We we can take it from fund balance. Uh, but one of the ideas that we did uh, kick around at the board retreat was, in addition to what Director Nichols was saying about having a, a very close nexus to. Uh, the Woolsey Fire was also to have it community-wide, district-wide. It wasn't for a one particular small project for one particular group um, that we were we were looking at more of a district-wide uh, like solutions or community. Uh, again, using the word stimulus, uh, that one of the for using this the money for this.
this and then even and again giving more sneak peeks of last time or next time and, and one of the things we were going to ask uh, recommend is the, uh, the double matching remember the double matching that we did for the 50th anniversary uh, and, and sort of encourage uh, more widespread community use uh, and then instead of matching uh, for a $50,000 project 2525 uh, they can do a $75,000 project and the, and the the district would take in fifty thousand dollars, and the, the, the community partner would take in twenty-five thousand. So it was like a two to one, and that was the idea. We kicked around at the board of retreat that it's another good idea to spread the spread the love throughout the community um, as a result of the Woolsey fire and because of the COVID pandemic to spread the love throughout the community. Okay. Any other? Oh, I have one quick one, uh, Mr. Hare. On the baseball Canal Creek South restroom, um, what aspect of the restroom still need uh, work and completion? Well, the, the place to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? They did. The, the, the actual toilet. Yeah, all, all the interior. Think, uh, George, what they did uh, for the first phase, uh, they had enough money to do the sewer connection and the shell of the building. So what they need to do is uh, basically do all the finishing of that's inside the restroom. Wow, that's a lot. Okay. Um, so what percentage of the total cost are they underwriting? Oh, uh, 50%. Okay. So the additional... Twenty thousand. See, it's gonna cost forty. I'm sorry, Director Holt. Another forty thousand dollars to finish the project, um, and it's so they're they're kicking in twenty thousand dollars. That's what I was trying to determine. Yeah. Thank you, Director Holt. All right. Any other comments or questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Uh, Chair Lang, I have a quick comment again. Okay, Cusworth. Um, I know this wouldn't um, affect all of the projects, but I do know that the Chumash Museum had extensive damage in the fire, and some of their money would be used to help um, recreate a lot of the things that they lost, you know, at their Chumash village. And um, I also know that the Stagecoach Inn is, wants to use a uh, considerable part of the money in trying to make their facility accessible considering guidelines for COVID-19. That's not the fire, but it's also, you know, another sort of, uh, you know, pandemic or something that's helping. So I cannot say my words properly right now, but. You know, it's another disaster, I guess, that this would help them to reopen and they both lost a lot of revenues from, you know, both the fire, not the stagecoach in, not from the fire, Shumash from the fire and stagecoach in from the pandemic. So um, I don't know if that would help ease your conscience somewhat. And I also do remember at our retreat, we did talk about this extensively on how we wanted to use this money. So, and we did mention that we wanted it to go, you know, not just for fire. And I know that we did mention definitely clearing out creeks and we were going to use a lot of the money for that and for things of the fire. But we did at the retreat also talk about that we would be using it for other community projects. So, um, but I, I mean, I would want you to vote your conscience, but that is something that was discussed previously. Okay, thank you, Director Kessler. Because yes, just for you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Director Cusworth, for the comments. Uh, I guess my, my concern is twofold that uh, there was nothing in the report to state what you just stated, that there was a relationship directly to the use of those funds based on the fire damage or whatever was there. And secondly, uh, you know, I don't like to get in the habit of saying, oh, we've got this extra money over here. Let's just tap into that because it's really easy to use and it's not pegged so far. And I would like to see a full proposal for the entire use of the money on how it's going to be used before we start using it. 
And so that's the, the two reasons why I would reject at this point. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Director Nichols. Any other comments or questions? Uh, entertain a motion at this time. Director Lang. Yes, Director Huffer. I'd like to move approval of staff recommendation to appropriate 36,000 from the SE settlement funds. Uh, and I'm not gonna read the, the numbers to fiscal year 2020, 2021 for the annual CIP grant program. Thank you. Is there I a second? second? I second. Okay, Director Holt seconds. Okay, any other comments or questions? If not, roll call vote, please. Director Lang. Yes. Director Nichols. No. Director Holt. Yes. Director Hopper. Yes. Director Cuthbert. Yes. Thank you, that motion will pass. We're moving on to item 9C, California Special District Association 2020 board elections. Jim, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Chair Lang and members of the board. This is really a, a board decision. You have two potential candidates. I believe the incumbent is Vincent Ferrante. Um, and the information about the two candidates, Dr. Robert Blair and Vincent Ferrante, are in your packet. Choose wisely. Okay. Any discussion? Anybody like to uh, nominate one of the two? I'll just say, Director Holt, you had your hand up? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it, I, you know, I, and I, I think probably you all agree. I don't know either one of these men. And um, Ferrante has been with the organization a long time and has had several um, official offices. And um, so I would recommend him. It was hard though. I mean, when you don't know the people individually, uh, I'm sure they're both qualified, but um, it would be, he would be coming back to, to this and he's served for many years. So I that's have the only I suggestion I can have. I don't know either man. Okay, I happen to have met both these individuals and um, I probably have had more direct uh, conversation in the past with Blair. He was also previously involved, but um, I'd like to hear from anybody else who has a- uh, Are you recommending- you a second for this motion? Was that a motion, Director Holt? No, not really, since I don't know okay. either. You know, yeah, that I was. You can make your own. Promotion. I was trying to listen, also, Huffer, Director Huffer. All right. Any other comments or questions, Director Nichols? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I too looked at the statements, candidate information statement sheets from the, the, the candidates, and both of them seem you know, more than more than qualified to be able to take on the, the position. Uh, I do recollect in our meeting with the uh, uh, SDA on Tuesday, our newly rec newly appointed uh, representative was recommending uh, Mr. Ferrante based on his active duty nationally, as well as him being an incumbent. So for that reason, I would uh, make a motion to uh, cast our vote for Mr. Ferrante. Thank you, Director Nichols. We have a, a motion. Is there a second? I can second that. Thank you, Director Holt. Any other comments or questions? If not, roll call vote, please. Director Lang. Yes. Director Nichols. Yes. Director Holt. Yes. Director Hopper. Yes. Director Hopper. Yes. Thank you, that motion passes and Mr. General Manager, I'm sure you'll uh, submit the proper paperwork. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am sure that Aline will submit the proper paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> okay, item 10, reports and announcements, our investment report for March 2020. 
Any comments or questions, Director Nichols? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question for Ms. Smith. As, the, as I look at the uh, <clears throat> rates that have been showing up in the month-to-month -month decline, I guess, from a year ago, a pretty steady decline, I just was curious with it going from about 2.5% to what appears to be just below 2%, is there any significant revenue uh, impact to uh, our bottom line as a result of these figures? Not right now. I think we're all waiting to see how this is through March. And so I think once we see the impact um, post-March, the more of the impact of uh, COVID. Might see that, but not significant to our budget. And is there any forecast as to where where the bottom might be based on where the stock market has been moving over the last few months? So they there's some estimates that say that our the yields will stay at about one percent, but that was before the last week, and the concern is that the last week might have affected consumer confidence, and so we really don't know. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You betcha. Okay. Uh, department reports. Uh, Parks Division, Mr. Hare. Thanks, Chair. I'm going to report many, many happy things going on with the Parks Division. Um, I sent you guys the email. I just want to reiterate that uh, we passed the 5 million kilowatt hour limit or limit threshold uh, for our six and a half years that we've been producing. Uh, solar energy, uh, so that's that's actually really cool. It's at like a little bit over 43%, I think it was. Well, nearly 44% of our electricity is sustainable green energy. And uh, Chuck had a fantastic question, which I'm gonna repeat for everybody. Um, Chuck asked, uh, so, but we're not using any energy lately, so what does that mean? You know, are we overproducing or, you know, or how, how does that work? Uh, so as a reminder, so when our power purchase agreement, we are uh, required to purchase every single kilowatt hour produced by our solar. Um, and the, the solar uh, carports are designed for 80% of the normal capacity of the facility. And that way, if there's a little, you know, so, it's, so they don't necessarily have to go over. But it's, 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 it's more of a collective number sync with them. But uh, with that said, we, you know, we have been overproducing the last couple of months. Um, but we get what's called a net energy uh, metering. We do net energy metering with Southern Cal Edison. We get a reduction on our on our uh, Edison bill because of that. Because, for lack of a word, we get we get kilowatt hours that go into a bank, you know, a theoretical bank, and then we get they get used the grid somehow. So when it's all said and done, our 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 cost per kilowatt hour with Edison is about the same as it was the prior year. So even though we're using, we're overproducing and using less, our costs are still the same rate that we had from, uh, from the previous year. It's a great question, Chuck, I appreciate that. Well, thank you. Um, and, um, and let's see, some other great news. Uh, also sent the email, we've got the $600,000 uh, Santa Monica Mountains uh, grant uh, for Rancho Petrero. Uh, uh, specific area or planning area number one of the specific plan that should be fantastic. Hopefully, we'll be getting together our uh, uh, so it's, it's Chair Lang and I think Chair Eric and Director Nichols are ad hoc committee. We'll get together with the city's ad hoc committee and, and talk about what to do uh, with the rental return question. We kind of want to put that project in, in that fold with that particular issue that we have going on. Uh, we are staff. And Rec and Park staff has been working together. Uh, we have identified a top proposer for the Canadian Community Park Project. Uh, we interviewed them on this past Monday. Um, it's pretty close as far as you know, like the scope of the compensation, but it's like any anything. You know, they have their ideas. We have our ideas. We had a really good hour and a half, two-hour conversation with them. Um, they're going to uh, resubmit to us and refine their their scope of compensation. Uh, we hope to bring that back to the board on June 18th for awarding a contract to the top proposer. Um, let's see what else I got here. Uh, and 
then, yes, I did mention a little bit uh, in my, during my uh, board report for the CIP grant. Uh, during the capital uh, budget on June 18th, we'll be uh, providing some, a lot more information about the uh, fire allocation and some adjustments we need to make to the, to the following uh, CIP year. Follow that to the following fiscal year CIP uh, program. Uh, just some minor, I would say minor adjustments, but just some additional things that we're recommending based upon the board retreat and the 10 year capital project uh, plan that we have in place. And using the nexus of uh, trying to use it as best as we can with the Woolsey Fire uh, and trying to spread the love throughout the community. So that's upcoming. Uh, it's been very interesting, a lot of fun to do that, but uh, that, that, that's coming up in a couple. I have a comment, uh, to, and you're welcome, Mr. Hare, uh, for the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy uh, $600,000 grant. I don't know uh, you. <laughs> and uh, uh, Rancho Simi Rec and Park District also, we also approved uh, a grant for their part of their trails program. Uh, I think it's for phase four. Uh, and if you've not been uh, to Rancho Simi Rec and Park to see that project, uh, I think you need to. It uh, is a great trails program. It follows the uh, drainage, large drainage system that goes through the, from east to west in the uh, Simi Valley. So um, a lot was accomplished. Um, we also had the LA Rivers and Tributary um, uh, plan approved, and it was an over a four hour meeting, but we accomplished a lot, including CRPD's $600,000 grant approval. Okay, any questions of Mr. Hare? Director Huffer. Yeah, Tom, I was just sort of curious. I would uh, I was going to go over to Canal Creek North this afternoon just to kick back and get out of the house for a little while, and it was locked up. And I was just wondering, was that because they were finishing up the the, the paving project or something? Or yeah, I, I know they were uh, finishing up the striping um, and through a, a lot of different parking lots. It was I know it was happening yesterday and today, so that's probably most likely what's going on. And then they have to, and, and actually I don't know for sure, but they will be doing it soon, um, putting in uh, the, the, the speed bumps that they took out. So that's, I don't know if that was going on today, but it's supposed to be happening within the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Director Nichols? No, nothing for me, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other questions of Mr. Hare? If not, we'll move on to uh, 11B, Recreation Division. Cheryl, I mean. What's your name? No, thank you, Cheryl. Um, so you do not have a recreation highlight tonight because you've had a wonderful presentation um, this afternoon and um, just the staff did an awesome job, as you guys had already said. They had very short notice that I gave them, and they whipped that together, and it is really neat to see it all come together and really remember what we're doing out there, even though it's not our normal daily stuff and we're not as busy as we normally would be. There's a lot of really good things going on, so um, I'm glad we were able to share that with you tonight. Um, we opened registration on Monday. Um, we are doing some modified programming, as Jim said, towards um, essential care needs for child care. So we have all-day camps that are opening, and we have half-day, three-hour camps that are opening. Jim already told you the program, number of programs and how many are currently enrolled, um, but basically I'll give you a little more detail. So we're at about 50% of our total maximum enrollment right now since Monday as of yesterday, so not today's numbers. Uh, the camps that are full days were over 50% full. The clubs, which are the half day, we're at about 25% full. Skate camps has sold out three sessions. The TR tween camp has sold out 11 sessions. 
Wildwood Camp is at 83% full. Um, so it's for three days in at that point, it's not bad, it's not great, but it's not bad. And I think that as school is ending this week and next week's coming and as things change, there might be the opportunity for more enrollment. Our community centers will not be open, as Jim had said, but we will be running programs out of them. It will not be open for people to just come up and talk to us or come into the building and use the restroom or anything like that. It will just be for the program. There's lots of rules that the staff are having to learn, that they're going to have to implement, they're going to have to train their staff on, all sorts of stuff. So the team is really doing good at kind of zigging when we zag and zag when we zig because every 30 minutes it seems like it's a new rule or a new form or something. Um, the tax program is going to be reopening, um, so Julie is working on getting that going. Um, also with many adjustments and, and new rules, but um, that we will be able to offer the service, so we're excited about that. And as Jim said, for 4th of July, just with everything else going on, we did finally have to make the, um, the decision, so we have postponed our 4th of July concert to next 4th of July. So. They will be our, um, and that is, that's the process that we're doing about 30 days before any concert. We're asking the group if they would like to book the next year, so we're trying to just move them. Um, we will not cancel any additional concerts until about 30 days before, and we're working with the band. So um, the pancake breakfast and the home run derbies are, and the open swim are also at this point going to be postponed to cancel this year um, just due to you can't plan something with less than 30 days. It's the staffing. There's just so much, so much goes into it that it's just not feasible to do for our staff. So, um, on top of basically the social distancing hasn't been released and it's all the rules that are currently in place for us. Um, you mentioned churches. We discussed today actually that um, we have about three different locations that have used our buildings for churches, that churches use our buildings for. So we will be reaching out to them probably early next week and opening our doors to them as a rental because they were with us before as a church as long as they follow the guidelines that are required for churches. The 25 or the 25 percent or the under 100, and as long as they can meet all the social distancing and all those rules, so we will be working on opening that up for the churches that were using us before this started. Um, church of the Tax Program, and I think that is it. So I'm available for um, questions. Yeah. Are there any questions for Rochelle? Um, I have yeah. questions. Director Custer. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I know that you can't tell me all of the child care protocols that you have because there's probably a huge list, but are there just basics like how many children can be in a camp and how much time do they have to be inside or outside and how much sanitizing there needs to be? Or is there's going to be, we're going to have a, a one to ten ratio. It has to be the same the same pod of kids every day for five for five days. So we're not we have to keep everything consistent. It has to be the same staff every single day. Um, so there's no intermixing of staff. Um, and then obviously we have to do the social physical distancing. Um, we are requiring that kids have um, cloth face covering with them at all times. We're going to try to do most of our programming as much as possible outside. That way they won't have to necessarily wear them as long as we can keep the social distancing. Um, but if they go inside or if they're going to come in close proximity to other people, then they will at least have their face masks to cover their faces to keep others safe. Um, child care requires that um, they do a health check before they arrive. So all, ch all children will do a health check. And that will include a um, thermometer reading with a scanner, and a no touch. Um, so if they're running a fever of 100.4 or higher, they may not attend. When they get checked in, they have to sanitize. So I have a sanitizer squirter there. And so they sanitize, and then they go off to their group. Um, share utility, the stuff that they have, whether it's art 
or whatever. It won't be communal crayons and stuff like that. There will probably be these, here's your box of crayon blue, whatever, for the week, and then sanitizing it at the end of the week. There will probably be two kids to a six-foot table, one on this end, one on that end type of thing. The whole, everything has to be looked at. Bathroom runs are going to be different. They're going to have to schedule times that they, you know, do transition and take kids to the restroom because it'll be the whole group and they have to spray and wipe things down before the next kids go in. So oh, okay. That sounds pretty complicated. So I salute you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Director Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tell us a question, but we're talking about your 72 hour count of three days of enrollment. How, how did that compare to 2019 or the past? You mentioned the different percentages 25%, 50%. I that, haven't looked at it. Okay, I didn't know if that was high, low, or if, it, if you're measuring it against what you were expecting. From past yeah. records. The, um, we have we're not measuring it at okay. this time to past years. I mean we're very low. Our revenue usually in the first um, week or so is about two hundred thousand dollars and we're at thirty six thousand dollars. Sure. So um, the other thing that's different is our half day camps in order to run them with the smaller numbers and all the requirements, they actually doubled in price. Okay. So they may not instead of 350 to 450 an hour, it's 850 an hour. Okay. And that doesn't include overhead. And am I re remembering correctly that you were trying to target a number that you had to have for minimum enrollment? Is that basically the, is the minimum also the maximum, whether there's 10 or 12, that that's like you have to have that number or the class doesn't move forward? So our number right now for the groups of 10 is a minimum of eight, eight. Okay. and a maximum of 10. So if we don't hit the eight, we'll be trying to combine them with other groups. But eight is where we'll break even, okay. per se. Okay. Right. And, and that's for the, the three-hour camp. And I don't know, just, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but in an effort to try and encourage people to come along, because I know there's a lot of hesitancy to get out there, but if you do get seven, you know, six, for example, say, well, okay, maybe there's some offset where we'll at least kind of get get something started, maybe get the flywheel moving a little bit so that in the fall those people will come back. Have you had those discussions? I expect an answer. Just thinking about that, just to kind of prime the pump, you know, just like, yeah, okay, we might have to, you know, maybe not go with what we'd like, just to kind of say we had a program to kind of get things moving towards the fall. So. I, it's just me thinking out loud. Yeah, no, we definitely think about that. Um, right now, we're just looking at the eight. Um, but before anybody cancels anything, we usually talk to their managers, and those 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 can combine. Those will combine. Okay. All right. And going back to the great presentation tonight, I'm asking you, but Mark's listening. Could that be available as a clip rather than part of the entire uh, board meeting, just to have that clip? You can share a link and say, hey, look at this. I can probably, Kelly's the one that actually ends up monitoring, clipping and putting the logo on the videos after Mark sends it to her. Um, we've been struggling with the programs that she's been trying to, to do because our board meetings are so long. It's very hard and very long to download things. But it's uh, where I'm going to work. <laughs> it, um, <laughs> it will, um, she could potentially, we can ask her to cut that. We're actually going to be applying for the the, the grant or the work CPR, not CPRS. Yes, yes. Yes, um, so we'll have to clip it anyhow, probably for that. So well, maybe we should start taking breaks every 45 minutes to have a little. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, also, just as a, this is a, a question for Mr. Huffer. Uh, we, we were going to offer some for the since the seniors are so used to going through the drive-through at the uh, adult center, you're going to offer the drive-through tax returns as an option. <laughs> well, uh, that's going to be a little bit difficult, I think. But they they do have a lot of procedures in place that are going to try to at least minimize the the potential for exposure. Yeah, appreciate your helping to keep that going again, as well as uh, Ms. Beebeck. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all for me. Okay, Mr. Huffer. 
Yeah, I had a, a question, Rochelle, since, I mean, these are summer camps and, and even when things were, you know, year, years past, summer camps are outdoors for the most part, but pretty much restricted to outdoors. Are there some contingency plans if and when the temperatures start skyrocketing? So the clubs will be able to, the centers are going to have rooms available that will be assigned to different groups. Um, so some of them will, but like Wildwood Camp, uh, Thousand Oaks Camp, some of those camps, they are all outside and they have been outside for, for years. So, um, you know, we'll probably get some water play out there. The one thing that they won't, I mean, it's camp going to look very different this year. You know, it's not going to be 50 kids all sitting in a circle singing songs and kumbaya and all that good stuff. It's going to be everybody six feet apart with a mask, a leader with a mask on singing a song because of the spit and the spray. Um, so it's just going to look really, really different this year. But hopefully, um, you know, the staff is super creative, so they'll keep them hopefully having fun and, and you know, building bonds within the tent. Um, they will be able to, as Jim had mentioned, go in and like use the gymnasium, but there'll be processes that'll have to go into place on how the ball gets used. They all get assigned a ball, then it gets put in a bucket, and then I'm gonna have to have a staff that comes in and cleans all the balls afterwards. And so there's just, you know, what's not in the cost of camp right now is that there's probably gonna be an additional one or two staff that just literally are checking in and running around cleaning things all day long. So. Um, but they will be able to use the facility for the program. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rochelle, I have a question in reference to the other three uh, park districts, uh, Rancho Simi and Pleasant Valley. Um, have you heard how they're uh, starting up programs and integrating um, you know, the, the new norms for their camps? I've been on a call every week, and I believe we're the first to open and start taking registrations for this. Um, I know locally, our Boys and Girls Club and our YMCA are already doing um, camp. Uh, YMCA started this week, and Boys and Girls Club has been doing it, I believe, since um, like March, April for essential workers. So um, I know some of our staff, Summer, has been in contact with the director over the Boys and Girls Club, and they've been talking about how they've been doing things and stuff, so sharing ideas. Um, but I, I don't think Rancho or Pleasant Valley have it on the books yet to start anything. Do you remember? No, you're ahead yeah, of me. So. Yeah, I think so. right now. Okay, so you said we're ahead of the other two park districts. Yes. Very good. Okay, any other questions for Rochelle? If not, we're moving on to Management Services Division. Melissa Smith. Thank you, Chair and members. Um, Y'all are going to have to hear me talk a lot next time when we bring the budget. So I have no report, but I'm available. Okay, we're looking forward to that. Um, 11D, General Manager's Report, Mr. Friedel. I bet staff that this light agenda would cause the meeting to be over before sunset, which is at 801. So I have no report tonight. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Uh, okay. I <laughs> Mr. Chair, I have a question. Director Nichols has a question. Director Nichols, you have a question of the general manager? Is this like the Lakers game where the defense is less than, or the opponent's less than her points, you buy tacos or something? <laughs> yeah, there's money on the line. Uh, just a question. I noticed in the, uh, our expense report this evening, there were some uh, expenditures for the teen and adult center project, which I know has been postponed, but it just caused me to, to uh, question with that project now on hold, and I know some of the initial work was underway. Is that just indefinite? Is there something uh, uh, pegged for the future, or is that in discussions with the city, and is there 
just some wrapping up to do now to kind of bring things to a logical halt? I think um, the understanding that I have in a conversation with the city is they just wanted to put it off one year because they don't really yet know the full impact of the last three months on their budget, and they kind of want to say, okay, let's postpone it one year, see what happens to us, what's the fallout and the impact, and then we'll look at it for the following year. Um, there is a lot of value to having had all of the work that's done to date so that it's like essentially a shovel-ready project. I mean, there's even discussion that one of these relief bills at the federal level might be an infrastructure bill or something that encourages, you know, shovel-ready projects to get going if they need that kind of stimulus. So getting it to the point that it's that's great. I hope it's something that gets picked up next week, but a lot will just depend on the city's budget. It, uh, we, we were about a month away from putting it out there putting out a bid when the COVID hit and the city said, oh, so we said, so can we finish a month's worth of work just so it's ready to go? So that's why we, you know, however many, fifty, sixty thousand dollars dollars whatever it was. Uh, so we had the consultant finish it up um, and then we submitted to the city. So we, it's just like Jim said, so it's permitted, it's, it's ready just to go out and Great, so all, all the design work is done, all the permitting, yeah. all the entitlements, so right. it, yeah, it just, literally is a shovel-ready project. Yeah, literally, literally, someone says, go ahead, we'll put it out the bid. Awesome. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, moving on to director's reports. Anybody want to, Director Holt? Uh, yeah, well, in addition to this Zoom, there have been a couple of Zooms this, this week. Uh, one is the uh, one from CARPD, uh, which was uh, very interesting. But of course, our general manager sent the list too. So I think uh, we're in good shape. Although I was going to ask, uh, do you have a thermometer now that you take people's temperature when they, they come in? I, I wasn't sure about that one. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, and also from CARPD, there is a PDF available um, that you can get from them um, uh, just to summarize everything that was on that, that report. And then in addition, another Zoom, um, they honored the, 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 uh, the Caneo Valley uh, uh, adults, uh, senior adults uh, honored uh, the, what? Senior of the year. Senior of the year. Of the year, yeah. They honored the senior of the year, who is Jackie Pizitz. And I know, um, I've known Jackie forever and ever, it seems, although she's been here longer than I in, in Thousand Oaks. And mostly my, my contact with her over the last number of years has been through the, the uh, state coach in. But um, anyway, so Chuck, you were at that, uh, right? Uh, yes. the, the presentation they did on Zoom um, because they couldn't hold a regular meeting uh, or a luncheon, which is usually what they do. However, in the afternoon, which I also went to, they, they got a parade together of cars and people in the cars are people who had worked with her in different organizations and paraded down the street and around her house with signs and waving at her and um, so it, it was really kind of interesting. And uh, Nellie was at that one too. So um, it's, it's been a busy Zoom week. So have a good rest of the week. Director Huffer. Well, Director Holt already mentioned the, the, the two Zoom meetings that I participated in the senior of the year yesterday. And um, I have to admit, I, I really, really regretted not having the, the chicken luncheon that we normally have for <laughs> that event. So, um, and then the CARPD conference uh, last Thursday and Friday, I think it was, uh, was really good and there was a lot of good material there. And we do have to congratulate Director Nichols for a hotly contested election. Oh, as, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as as one, one of the at-large board members for CARPD, CARPD. So, Doug, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. 
and then I I am looking forward to uh, restarting the uh, CSVP tax program, which will be running from June 15th through July 15th. Um, it's going to be very strange because they're going to put us in separate rooms and they're separating us from our clients by plastic sheeting and it, it, it's it's going to be a very different process, but uh, it'd be nice to to get back to that, and hopefully we'll be able to help at least some of the folks here in town with that. Thank you, Director Huffer. Any other? Yes, Director Kessworth. Uh, yes, I I missed the um, presentation on Zoom for Jackie because, of course, I was at an IEP presentation on Zoom. I'm so tired of Zoom. <laughs> Uh, but she was really thrilled with that drive-by, and uh, so it was very nice. That was all set up by uh, Julie, and so that that was nice. A lot of people brought flowers, and we had cards, and her husband, you know, figured out a way to, for some reason, to have her out there on the driveway when everybody. I know. Yeah. It was it was very nice. Um, and then also, you know, I I think most of us were at that meeting on Tuesday. You know, when we had. Uh, uh, Chief of Police speak, and that was again very interesting. And uh, I know they asked him to speak quite a long time ago, but it was quite very appropriate considering you know what the current situation is to get a viewpoint from the police of how they were handling um, the protests and things in Thousand Oaks, which of course have been mainly peaceful, which is nice. So I thought that was very interesting. I said at our last meeting that the stagecoach gym was going to be opening, uh, but they're not going to be opening because. They're um, having to get a lot of protocols in place, and it's taking a little bit more than they thought. I think they're being highly optimistic on how many people they think are going to come, because they don't usually have very many people come. But they, they do want to do everything right, and that's going to cost them some money, and all of their volunteers are over 70. So that's early. I'm a young one there. So um, that's going to be something, too. And then I also wanted to mention, just on a light uh, form, is I have a new hobby. I've done it twice. It's Frisbee golf. Mm. And uh, yes. I, yes. What? Disc golf, sorry. Yeah, disc golf. Your frisbees to F word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's disc golf. And it's fun you don't use frisbees. You use these discs. And it's a whole different thing. So I guess you participated, Mr. Hare, in disc golf. Oh, so disc it, it golf? Was, Is that what she said? Disc, disc golf. golf. Oh. It's really fun. And you know what we need is? to get more people there. I went with my uh, friend, and not only were we the only women, we were the only ones over 40. And uh, so it's mainly kind of a 25 to 45 year old male uh, sport. So I've done it twice, and the second time I highly improved. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, but one fellow there told me that he used to play racquetball. But now that he can't play racquetball, he started doing this. And when my friend first invited me, I thought, you know, she says it might be crowded. And I thought, it's not going to be crowded. Yeah, there are a lot of people out there playing disc golf. And so, again, it's a, made me appreciate, uh, you know, some of the things that we are offering here at CRPD. So uh, I think that ends it for me. Thank you. Uh-huh. Director Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I too just wanted to note that I attended the Zoom meeting for the CARPD. It seemed like it was a Zoom background conference that turned into a Rec and Barsk Association activity. Uh, very creative individuals when it comes to their Zooming backgrounds. Uh, obviously, they had plenty of time to figure this out, but it was very entertaining nonetheless. And also, I attended the Ventura County Special Districts Association meeting on Zoom. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Nichols. I too was involved in various Zoom meetings. I also wanted to mention, you may be aware that there's three new uh, mountain lion kittens in the Santa Monica Mountains uh, that were recently born, um, all healthy, and it uh, looks like you know, we've got some more mountain lions in our future, so that's good. <laughs> Any other uh, comments or questions by the directors? If not, we'll move on to uh, item 12, requests for status reports and items for subsequent agendas. Yes, Director Nichols. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question for our general manager. 
In fact, on March 19th, we declared a local emergency. Is there a process that we'll need to follow to undeclare a local emergency? There is. I will check on our language. For the fires, what we had done was piggybacked on the cities because it was really, you know, the emergency response was largely city-driven. So we declared an emergency and said that ours would terminate when theirs terminated. And I don't know if I kept that same language in there for ours, meaning it would terminate sooner than when we terminated or when the city did. So I will have to check. I can't recall if I had that clause in there. I will check on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Is that a hand up there, Director, Mr. Friedel? No. No. Okay. Just the background again. All right. Items from the public. Do we have any public? If not, is there a need for executive closed session? No. Okay. With that, we're going to adjourn this meeting until two weeks from tonight. All have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Eight oh three. Eight oh one was something. No, you know where. No, you know where this call was.